All right. Thank you again, Elaine, and thank you to the Mark Twain Library for their continued interest. Um, so she 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 kept me off pretty well. I'm a folklorist primarily at this point. Um, I have a pretty long history of making what I guess I would call vocal centric music. And uh, I founded the Fieldwork Archive recently. Uh, it's the product of three years of active work, but it has deeper roots. Um, I guess I'll say a little bit about what the Fieldwork Archive really is before I get into those deeper roots. Primarily, it's a collection of unaccompanied vocal performances. And the, the emphasis I have on the collection is memory of pure oral tradition, which is getting harder and harder to find in the 21st century. Um, I would say, with great exception, most of the people that are still alive today were born in what you would call pretty aptly the silent generation or the traditionalists. You have some outliers that are still a member of the greatest generation, born anywhere between like 1910 and 19. I'll be generous and say 25. Most people at this point that are still living have been born after that time. Um, I did meet a woman who was 102 and she had been born in 19, 1919 and that was a real treat, but mostly you're left with the silent generation. And uh, what, I, what I find has happened as I've interviewed a lot of people is that they have only a very vague memory or kind of a last wisp of familial oral tradition. And it's for this reason that I decided that this needed to be in some sort of permanence because it is going away very quickly. And one of the things that I've noticed a lot of people say in reaction to this is, oh, that's so cool, I wish I could do that. And you, you can, I mean, you, you, everyone has an iPhone, you could go interview your relatives. It doesn't have to be about music, but I think that an emphasis on preserving some of the memories of, of an earlier age, we're really on the brink of losing a lot of this really important cultural fabric. Um, certainly a lot of the things I've captured have made me very proud to be an American. I'll walk you through some of the highlights. Um, most of, of the collection uh, is unaccompanied vocal performance and often it's songs that someone might have sung in childhood. They either learn them at church, at school or from their parents or uncles or grandparents. Um, so that's really the, the emphasis of and the backbone of the collection. But in this work, I've also been in touch with ballad scholars, old time musicians, revivalists, um, librarians, lay people. And so I have memories from people that might have researched this stuff as well, but, but more in a sense where it means a lot to them. It's not just a, like a, you know, it's so easy nowadays to go on YouTube, find an old song, learn it and sing it. And then, you know, you're sort of like, oh, this person knows this old song, but you don't know where they got it from. So the emphasis is really on finding people that have familial or systematic tradition, church, school, home, that they've learned these songs from. So you're often left with fragmentary memories, but I think that there's something really beautiful about the fragment and, and the way that there are these kind of small bursts of memory amidst attempted recollection and yeah, kind of this, this wispiness of, of, the, of the material. So some of the recordings are very short. Um, I think we'll get through a lot of highlights very quickly for that reason. Um, but I guess I wanna say a little bit about the deeper roots that this project has. Uh, when I was about 19, my grandma was 89, and I think around that time I got my first mobile phone, or I might have been 17 and she was 89, and I started to just sort of casually record her every once in a while. She wasn't a singer, but she'd grown up in um, upstate New York and had a lot of weird blue blood jobs and, and had a wicked sense of humor, so these were personal recordings for myself, and they started around, yeah, I would have been 17, it was like 2008, and I had this sense of, she's 89, she may not be here tomorrow. And she ended up living for 10 years. So I had this, this spine of 10 years of recordings of this woman. And when she passed away, of course, I put them into like a playlist and chronologue, you know, as kind of a eulogy to her. And what I was really struck by was this sense of a spine of experience and, and kind of her shifting through the years. And, and they were snatches, it was conversations, it was jokes, there was never singing. My family was not really musical, but this kind of, pre-trained my brain to think about preservation, archiving, librarianship, you know, all of these things that I've incorporated into this archive. Um, and that was a very personal practice for me. Um, and when she passed away, it became very obvious that I needed to somehow make sense of these moments and, and put them in chronological order and find out, you know, when the MP3 was exported and, you know, try and get clues of, you know, and it was for myself. Um, and, and it was a really kind of healing experience because some of the recordings are like ambient recordings. You know, I can just put my headphones on and it's like we're having tea again. It's really a beautiful experience. Um, but I didn't really give it 
further thought as far as practice went. Like I wasn't really comfortable at that point with doing that with other people necessarily, but it meant a lot to me. And as I said in the beginning, I've made music for a long time. So working with audio in a more fluid way has always kind of appealed to me. Um, you flash forward a year and a half and I was struck by these recordings made by the WPA in 1939 in North Carolina, right on the border of Tennessee in a little town called Elk Park. And they were made of this woman called Lena Turbyfill. And Lena was a faith healer and a singer and a dancer. And she could, she was always like providing for her family, doing laundry, cooking, sewing. And uh, there were only two recordings of her published at the time that I discovered her. There were dozens more in the Library of Congress because these recordings had been made en masse for the WPA in the 30s as part of the Works Progress Administration. They wanted folklorists as part of that huge umbrella program to go out and preserve some of the cultural memory and tradition that even in the 30s was already sort of starting to go out of favor. You had cinema, you had radio, it changed the way people sang, it changed the tone of their voice. They weren't out in the field wild crafting and harvesting and, and threshing. They were singing more in the home or they were hearing, you know, the criminals and the Elvises. So it was, it was subconsciously also shifting like the, the mental blocks of what a voice should sound like and how I'm gonna reproduce a vocal um, as, as a singer. So, so a lot of that was sort of already kind of going, waning and going away when Lena was alive and a young woman. I think she was 34 when she got recorded in 39. She was born in 1905. Um, but the, the real push for this archive was, was uh, after I met Lena's daughter, I'd had several conversations with grandchildren and nieces and nephews. And, and it eventually pointed me to Nikki who was Lena's last living daughter at the time. So in July of 2020, I went down to meet Nikki, spent some time in Appalachia um, and, and really got a sense of, of Nikki's passion for her mother's spirit. And even though Nikki was the youngest of eight children, she had this kind of like tugging on the skirt hem energy of like, what does that mean? Why are you wildcrafting? You know, what are these old sayings? You know, what is that? And I think she was probably of all of Lena's children, the most enthusiastic about the old ways. So she was a, a huge fountain of memory, not just song, but um, war rations and, and just different, different folkloric elements and, and some of the ways in which Lena led her life in Appalachia in, in the 30s, 40s and 50s and could recall a lot of that. And in working with Nikki in particular, I got a huge mirror of the work I'd been doing privately with my grandmother. And so that was sort of my first like, oh, so I can do this with other people. And, and it, it really celestially bridged this kind of what I thought would be a barrier. It was actually like a, a tunnel. You know, I was able to connect with this woman. You know, I've, I've had a lot of questions from people as I do this work of like, how did you wind up in a little hut in Appalachia? Like, what, how are you in these people's living rooms? You know, and, and, and it is this very organic um, connection to these people. Alan Lomax said, empathy is most important in field work. You have to put your hand on the artist while he sings. There's, you, you, you can't do this work and not be emotional about it. I think that that's a really like huge, you know, and so I think for, for that reason, when people say, I wish I could do this, I mean, I think you can, you just need to approach it from a perspective of being very respectful of the person's luggage, basically, their, their emotional standpoint, you know, what they might've gone through in their life. In Nikki's case, she had a lot of health issues you know, being very mindful of just their position in the world. And um, yeah, it was mostly working with Nikki that reminded me so much of the many recordings I'd made of my grandmother. Um, so that's kind of where I unofficially started this archive. Um, when I went down to have visits with Nikki, I also organically met a banjo maker and his wife, and they sang for me and played banjo and fiddle and whatever. And so I was starting to sort of accumulate these recordings and I also met an old time musician by the name of Bobby McMillan, uh, who lived in Silo, North Carolina. And Bobby and I, um, sort of through my friend Will Ritter, we became very fast friends. And Bobby was an old time musician, but also had this like archive fever. Like he was interested in the old recordings from the 30s that I was looking up. You know, he, he was as much looking forward as he was sort of looking back. And so I would get an email from Bobby like, been raining here all day and night and I don't know when it's going to let up by the way there was this woman in 1937 that got recorded by so-and-so could you please call Berea College and see if you can get those recordings I'd love for us to both to hear them so he was like a guiding light for me 
And um, when Nikki passed away in February of 2021, and then when Bobby passed away in November of 2021, um, it, it was hard, but it also um, made it really clear to me that there's sort of an urgency to, to this work, which is why I've been um, so visible about it lately and why I decided to found this archive. Um, so I, um, I'm shifting, shuffling the chronology a little bit. I also had the opportunity last summer to live in York, England for four months. So I was in North Yorkshire for like, a, you know, over a quarter of a year and uh, brought my recorder with me. So this is a Zoom H4n and uh, I've had the opportunity to upgrade in price, but I really think that you can't beat the H4n. It's like, you can get a nice one on eBay for 250 and you, you, you can't really spend more money and get better quality audio unless you're getting some bizarre Japanese thing for $2,000 that I wouldn't even know how to work. So um, if you wanna do this work and spend more and, and get something a little better than an iPhone, the Zoom H4n is, is the way to go. Um, but uh, yeah, I brought this with me when I went to England. And, and the thing that I was experiencing there from a lot of ballad scholars and a lot of people in the old time kind of pub circuit was that, um, oh, you can't find these songs anymore. No one in England sings them. Everyone's, you know, like it's so crowded there. The population is so dense. They were like, you're just not gonna find them. And I did, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person that if I'm, I'm challenged by something, I wanna defy that and say, yes, I can, I'm gonna do that. So I, I made some recordings. Um, primarily I was going to nursing homes and retirement communities because it was kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. There were a lot of long living people in a high concentration. And so there was a better chance I would get memory, but I made all sorts of recordings in England. Um, and that's where I met this woman who was 102. Um, so I came back from, from Yorkshire and I, I tried to shine a light on some of the folk traditions in Connecticut of which there are very few. And I did meet an old time fiddler by the name of Jane Prentice. I met a couple of barn dance callers. Um, it's, it's not as prevalent in New England as it is in Appalachia for some reason, but I did try to continue this work. So I was making recordings. I was interviewing people. I was asking these questions. Um, and, and now it's sort of second nature. If I meet someone who is longer living, my first question is, well, did your family ever sing to you? So, you know, it's, it's become more and more uh, a reflex for me where it might've been a little bit more mysterious or kind of, there was a barrier at first. I think that this is something I'm, I'm, I've, kind of grown into. Um, and so despite doing all of that and going to these other areas, I felt that there was more to be understood about Lena Turbyville. So I actually lived in Elk Park all summer in like a town on the border of Tennessee of like 500 people somehow had an address there. It was pretty mystical um, that I was able to, to root there for a little while and spent about the same amount of time in Appalachia as I did in North Yorkshire, about four months, and, and really got uh, to do some deeper work with Lena's family and community and, and um, preserve some of the memories that people had um, of Lena. And so uh, I promised myself when I got to 200 recordings or 300 recordings, some nice round even number, I would do something with them because they were accumulating with all these experiences I've had. Um, and so I reached 200 recordings and it looked like I could write a grant and submit them to a university and deposit them somehow. It looked like I could put them up on internet archive and nothing was really appealing to me. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, I like to sort of mark my own territory. I guess I'm, I'm kind of an independent um, creative energy. So I, I wanted to just have my own home that I could like, you know, control and update as much as I wanted to. So, um, the, the process with like places like Duke or University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, it looked like it was gonna be a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of acceptance. Like if I had a new bulk of recordings, it might take some time for those to be visible. And this, you know, I have full control. Um, and, and it like, I could get a song in the morning and it could be there by the afternoon. Um, so I, I wrote this entire website in cPanel uh, with the help of my assistant, Claudio, who's been working with me since 2014 and I thought this was gonna take months but he's so amazing, it took like two weeks to get those 200 recordings up. I was like flabbergasted. I was really in awe of like his, his power and his um, ability to organize because that's something I, I don't always know how to do. Um, so uh, we're currently at 320 recordings in the archive uh, and I've begun to sort of feebly accept donations um, 
I've had a few people that want to like sing the songs, but they've learned them from a text and they want me to just like upload them and use my server space. And I'm like, that doesn't really feel right. And I've had a couple of people give me older recordings from the 70s that they want me to like digitize their tape and cut it up. And that doesn't fit in with my chronology. So um, the first recording I accepted as a donation, uh, I'm gonna actually go by catalog number because it's towards the end. Uh, I, I got contacted by this person um, who had been in uh, Virginia this spring. So right when I was um, going down to North Carolina, uh, and um, and it just sort of made sense. That's the wrong version of that song, um, but I can get to it. Um, so one of the neat features I have on this website is if two people sing the same song, I list the variants down here. So if you want to cross compare or you're like lost in the list and you're like, did I hear this already? You can kind of double check if there's a variant. So um, got contacted by Alex. Um, he had gone to um, Woodlawn, Virginia, and he actually said, uh, this project was so inspiring to him that he drove from Canada to North Carolina. And I was like, I wouldn't even do that. <laughs> um, but anyway, he, he went to a couple of Fiddler's conventions and he met old time musician Willard Gayhart, who's, I couldn't believe Willard was still alive. And this is kind of what I'm saying about these last wisps that we're trying to preserve. Um, and, uh, and he recorded Willard um, singing this song he learned in school as a youth. So I'll play the swap song for you. Well, the one I remember us singing, we wanted to sing all the time, and it was called uh, uh, When I was a little boy, I lived by myself All the red and cheese I had, I laid it on the shelf Wing wham waddle to my Jack Frost straddle To my John Ferris faddle to my long ways home uh, The rats and the mice gave myself such a life I had to go to London to get me a wife Wing wham waddle to my Jack Frost straddle to my John Ferris faddle to my long ways home. Uh, let's see how it went from there. Uh, the roads were so wide, the streets were so narrow. I had to bring her home in an old wheelbarrow. Wing wham waddle to my Jack Frost straddle to my John Ferris faddle to my long ways home. And he goes on to all kind of situations and and he, he sold his, he uh, got him a mule and he sold his mule and rode a sheep and finally wound up, sold the sheep and got him a mole and the daggone thing went straight to the hole. <laughs> but, but they're, you know, funny songs like that. But there were sad songs, you know, the English ballads. A lot of them were really sad, like Barbara Allen, for instance. And and uh, there's one, uh, uh, Gypsy Girl, uh, that was recorded by uh, one of our old-time uh, Fellas, uh, what was his name? Back in the 30s, he recorded. Uh, I don't, the, the songs that we sung in school, the teacher taught them to us, and I don't know where they got them. Uh, but um, uh, they've just been handed down through their families, I guess. So, so anyway, this is, this is one of the donations I did accept. It fit in with the um, chronology of when I've been working on this and it fit in with like some of the locations I've been to and, and the emphasis, which was most important to me is, is Willard learned this uh, when he was young in school. And so it, it felt like a very organic oral memory. Um, but uh, Judy also knew a version of uh, the swap song or she called it the swapping song. Uh, so I, I, I try and link the variants. Um, so like, Judy Cook is someone who has been singing uh, since she was a young person um, for a long time and she knows hundreds of songs. So um, about every week I get on Zoom with Judy and she has something new and, and, and wonderful um, to share. So I'll play this one that she sang me called A Halloween Visitor. A Halloween Visitor. And I learned this in fourth grade. The moon across the velvet sky 
was creeping, creeping. The very shadows seem to lie sleeping, sleeping. When all at once behind the shed, a ghostly shape without a head jumped in like a phantom fled. Leaping, leaping. So I really love Judy. She's she's been a she's been a well of resource and she's been a lot of fun too. Um she's someone I found out after I put this page live. Um and she kind of came to me and was like, I have a lot of childhood songs and I'd love to sing them for you. And I was like, I'd love that too. So we've had a lot of fun together. Um, you'll notice the three, the, the, the same song three times in the beginning of, of the archive if you go by catalog number. And that's because Nikki um, remembered it and recited it. And then a few months later, she remembered it again. And I pretended like she hadn't done it for me. And she remembered it and recited it, but then sang it at the end. Um, and then by the time we met in person, uh, she sang it all the way through. So this was the first like in-person recording I'd made for the Fieldwork Archive. This is Lena's daughter, Nikki. And I love that she just took my field recorder like a walkie talkie. No one has no one has ever done that. They're always like terrified that it's even in the room. They're like, like kind of looking at it out of the corner of their eye. So one of the practices that I try and um, use when I record people is I try and kind of obscure the recorder like it might be on my knee or it might be on a coffee table because I think, yeah, if you know you're being observed, you behave differently, right? So I try and really make this into more of like a, um, yeah, a, a family thing. Oh, we have a broken image. I'm gonna have to look into that later. Um, but but I've recorded this ballad in in many different versions, and so the variants down there are are pretty. Um, you could get lost for a while. But I'll just I'll play a little bit of of Nikki. Bo Lincoln's was beach, very foundation as ever laid stone. He built a fine castle, and pay he got none. Where is the gentleman is he at home? He's gone to marry and visit his son. Where is the lady? Is she at home? She's upstairs sleeping, said the foster to him. How will we get her down such a dark night as this? We'll stick to little baby, full of needles and pins. They stuck to the little baby, full of needles and pins. The foster shoe on old Lincoln's he sang. While blood and tear cradle did run the she the uh, daughter Betsy climbed up in the tarot so high and saw her her father come riding hard by oh father oh father can you blame me Oh, Bo Lincoln's has killed your baby. Oh, Father, oh, Father, can you blame me? Oh, Bo Lincoln's has killed your lady. They hung old Bo Lincoln's to the sea gallows tree and tied the foster to the stake of standby. So that was like the first true recording that I made for the, the archive, being in person with someone. And, and at that time, in my mind, I wasn't aware that I was going to, this was going to be the, the end result of, of the work. But as I kept going, it became very clear to me um, that this was something worth preserving. So um, yeah, if you, if you navigate to the page, which is fieldwork-archive.com, it's, it's pretty easy to find. I tried to pick something that was pretty easy to punch in. Um, you know, there's a there's a PDF uh, that's always up to date of of every recording uh, in the archive. So if you wanted to download that and kind of get you know stamp collectory about it and look at it really closely, you could. Um, but everything is mirrored in the catalog number um, listing on the website. Uh,
Um, you can also browse by title if you want to just go in alphabetical order. Um, and you can also browse by tags. Um, 13 states represented right now. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. Uh, you also will come across the donated recordings like I've been into uh, outlined and, and various locales in the UK. They don't have states, so I tried to put like the township or the, you know, the, the province that the, the recordings were taken in. Um, Robin Hood Bay, uh, that I'll play that in a little bit because that's one of my favorite recordings. Um, songs with added verses, meaning that the person took a traditional song and adapted it and added some of their own text, maybe a humorous verse to round the song off at the end. Um, and then I have a couple of original songs, uh, which I chose to include because most of them were written by people that were old time musicians that you would predominantly think of as singing the old ballads and the old folk songs. And, and yet they wrote a couple of their, of their own um, songs, or in this case with the, the Gladiel song, um, Bobby, uh, my dear friend that I was talking about earlier, uh, I guess when he was about 11 or 12, he was really into the Tolkien books. And I guess, I haven't read them in a long time, but I sort of remember that there are like songs printed uh, in italics in, in chapters in the book. And um, I didn't get the rest of them from him, but he took every song in the books and set a melody to it. Um, so I think that's, that's worth listening to because this is one of the most beautiful recordings in the collection. I sang of leaves, of leaves of gold, and leaves of gold there grew. Of wind I sang, a wind there came, and in the branches blew. Beyond the sun, beyond the moon, the foam was on the sea. And by the strand of the moran there grew a golden tree. Where long the golden leaves have grown upon the branching years. While here beyond the sundering seas now fall the elven tears. O glory on the winter comes the barren leafless day. The leaves are falling in the stream, the river flows away. O glory unto long I've dwelt upon this hither shore, and in a fading crown have twined the golden Eleanor. But if of ships I now should sing, what ship would come to me? What ship would bear me ever back across so wide a sea? And uh, when he got to that line, uh, if of ships I now shall sing, what ship would come to me? Um, I just had this vision of like a giant golden galleon kind of coming into his little living room. And, you know, he was, he was pretty physically frail at that point. Um, so I think that, you know, a few months later when he did pass away, his ship did definitely come. So that's probably one of the more emotional ones um, in, in, the, uh, in the collection. But, you know, certainly that's sort of at the heart of the work that I'm doing is, is emotionality, memory, tenderness, fragility. Um, so Robin Hood's Bay, this is a lot of fun. Um, I, when I was in Yorkshire, I had written a little letter to the editor in their magazine called The Dalesman. And The Dalesman is like a quarter page, you know, everyone has it on their coffee table or whatever. Um, and I just was like, I'm in your country. I'm looking for old songs. If anybody knows any, this is my WhatsApp. This is my email, please be in touch. And that was in like November. Um, and then in J July this year, this woman emailed me and I don't know how she, it just took forever and that's okay. Um, but uh, she sang me this song uh, that she learned from her grandfather uh, who was born in 1876. And uh, it, it was just one verse of this song uh, that um, this was her WhatsApp picture and it was adorable. 
Um, it's called, uh, I've worked eight hours this day. And so she sang, uh, she sang this, this verse here, I believe. Um, and uh, my friend, Steve Gardham uh, is a broadside collector in, in the North of UK. And so he tracked down what she was actually singing, but I, I couldn't find it on my own. But um, he said, you know, I've, I've seen this song and I've read about it, but I've never heard it sung in the wild. So that was kind of fun. Um, so I'll play that for you. Robert Watson, 1876. And do you know the name of the town that he was born in? Robin Hood's Bay. Anyway, I'll, I'll see it here as, as I remember it. Patsy Dooligan, he went to school again. He went to the barbers to get a penny decent shave. He had lovely whiskers on, Galligan whiskers on. I'm glad that Barber he did behave. No, bad that Harvey did behave. He talked and he lathered and he jawed and he blathered till he got one side of Patsy's face so nice and clean. Then he went to the other side, the clock he spied, and he said, tomorrow I will finish your shave. For I've worked eight hours this day and I think I've earned my pay. Keep your whiskers on till the morning, John, because I won't work half a minute longer. Do you want me to sing it and get it right this time? Yeah, go, go ahead then. Right. Patsy Dooligan, he went to school again. He went to the barbers to get a penny decent shave. He had lovely whiskers on, Galligan whiskers on, and bad that barber, he did behave. He jawed and he lathered and he talked and he blathered till he got one side of Patsy's face so nice and clean. Then he went to the other side, the clock he spied, and he said, tomorrow I will finish your shave. For I've worked eight hours this day, and I think I've earned my pay. Keep your whiskers on till the morning, John, because I won't work half a minute longer. I only remember him singing that. He was a sea, he was a sea captain, and he probably knew more risque songs than that. But anyway, that was the one he used to sing to his children. Yeah. We lived with, we came to live with my granny and granddad when we when I was about three or four. Oh, I might play. All right. Um. So this was this is a recent edition. Um. I don't know how these people keep finding me and I'm just grateful that they do, but I, this was like a, um, someone around my age who makes like indie rock and, and I think has a few albums on the web somewhere and like followed me on Instagram or something. Um, and, uh, had found me, I maybe through like a, a recent interview I'd done, but anyway, was really interested, um, in, in the work that I was doing. And he said, yeah, my mom used to sing this weird, like mashup of, of like three songs but she didn't really sing it that often. And she said her dad sang it. And, and, I, and I talked to him and I was really like, really interested in um, the, the story behind that and what songs they were. So I, I, he was, uh, he lives in Philly, but he was by fortune in Texas near his mom. So I was like, can you, can you just record her for me? So I don't have to do a phone call recording as, as charming as they are. They're not always sonically. Um, Anyway, so uh, this is one of my favorites, uh, and it's a recent one, but the story she tells in the beginning is, is really beautiful. And um, yeah, leaving, leaving a lot of the, um, the family information in, um, even if it's sensitive, if someone is like willing to do that, and she was, um, means a lot to me. So I'll, I'll, play, I'll play this. So uh, my dad would, uh, we would go to bed, um, and it would be kind of dusk, and he would stand between the rooms, the bedrooms, and in in the fading dark, you know, the fading light, and he would just a cappella sing these songs to us, and it was sort of a treat. He didn't do it a lot, so it was sort of a big thrill when he did. The um, it I'll, I can go through the songs in a second, but the thing that was cool about this over time is that the songs would stick in my mind and so when my kids were little they would we'd be pushing them on the swing in the back and we had moved to a new town and the neighbor there were two uh, elderly women sisters that lived next door to us 
and I was pushing Alec, I think, in the swing, and I was singing these songs while I, we, we, uh, while he swang, and then um, Miss Cupin, the next door neighbor, called uh, called us through defense to come over, and she said, "Oh, I just love that you're." You're, you know these old songs, and it was a way that kind of bridged the gap to start a relationship with her and connection. And additionally, when my mom passed away, she had a bunch of strokes, a shower strokes, and it was actually her last day alive, and she was in hospice. She was appeared unconscious, but she was she was aware, but she wasn't speaking, and her eyes were closed. And we were um, in the room, my husband and I and my sisters, and I just started singing the melody, or the medley of songs, and we all kind of chimed in. And pretty soon, she was mouthing the words. Uh, she wasn't, there was no voice coming out, but she was saying the words, and her hand was tapping. And it was sort of a, just a way of communicating right there at the end. You know, that was probably the last communication I had with her. It was so, almost muscle memory. It that was. Point, that she was able to recall those songs at the very, very end. It was pretty poignant. It was. It was special. So, without further ado, uh, wait Till the sun shines nelly and the clouds go drifting by, we will be happy nelly, you and I together down. Lovers lane will wander, sweetheart, you and I. So don't you wait till the sun shines nelly, baby, by and by. You are my sun, whoops, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. Down by the old mill stream Where I first met you With your eyes so blue Dressed in gingham too it was there I knew that you loved me too. You were my ring, you were my queen, down by the old mill There were a few other ones in there. Our favorite one was the Shantytown, which I could never sing, and my dad hated to do it because he could never remember all the words. <laughs> there were so many words and they were fast. But we would sort of wait until he was all through and we'd say, do, do the one about the, the shack on the edge of town with the roof hanging down to the ground, to the ground. And he would try and do it. So. What about the bicycle boat for two? Yeah, it was in there too. Yeah. And at the end, I just... I, I just, but the thing that's neat is each song flows into the next, which flows into the next, which flows mm. into the next. Are they all? They're individual. But they're courses. individual songs, but were they at the same era, all of them? Yeah, yeah. So they do this whole medley of, of songs. You Are My Sunshine is one I think everyone knows. Um, but, but uh, you know, what's, what's so amazing to me is that people are willing to share these amazing personal tender moments with me and let them be public and preserved. And so, um, you know, it's, I always think of it, the songs are like the banner headline and the person's life is the article underneath. And you don't sit and read the headline all day, you, you, you engage with the article. So, um, you know, as I've done this work, the songs almost become less important. They are almost secondary to the stories that I, that I am able to, you know, bridge these connections with 
a, a husband and wife in Texas, you know? And, and so I asked Alec for a selfie or a photo of them because I think faces are so important. You know, I think it's really important to where I can connect people to who's actually singing the song. And, and you know, it's, it, for, for me so often, if I look at someone through history, I want a photo of that singer. You know, if someone's voice moves me, I wanna know what they look like and, and who they were, their attributes. So in a way that the, although it's the songs I'm chasing, they almost become secondary to this other human experience that can be had. Um, there was a folklorist in the 40s, uh, Helen Flanders, who operated in Vermont. And uh, I loved when she was building her archive, which I think houses something like nine and a half thousand songs um, and predominantly was taken in New England. So she's a, a, you know, a beacon of, of hope for me. Um, but she said something to the effect of, um, at the time uh, she'd written a forward to a book something along the lines of um, in the Helen Flanders collection, there are, you know, 500 recordings, 900 broadsides, two books and whatever and whatever. The individual experiences of collecting those items cannot be filed alongside them. There is a, a magic to the beginning of a day just beyond the windshield when you're driving out of the, the lot with what is to be neglected at home and you have your notebook and your microphone and your pad. And you're, you know, and, and it's like always different each time, but always so electric with the unknown. And, and I read that quote and it moved me. It's moving me now to think about it. And I think that this is the, you know, when, to circle back to what I said in the beginning where people are like, how are you getting these people's living room? It's this intangible ephemeral expression of, of some sort of beauty and fragility that, that unites me, the outsider, and, and these people with their family systems or school systems or, or you know, ability to recall what was impressed on them when they were younger and these family ties. And I think that, um, yeah, when everyone is like, I wish I could do this, I'm like, I really wish you would because you, we all can at this point. You know, we all have mobile phones. And I think it's really important to, to preserve these things. Um, so I, I think that you know, um, that's probably a pretty good ending point. Um, we, it looks like we have some chat and questions in Zoom. Um, and then if we're feeling brave after that um, uh, q and I did bring song printouts. If we want to try and sing one together, we can. Um, but, but let's get to Q&A first. So thank you all for, for your interest. Um, well, my hope is really that I'm going to receive more donations that feel appropriate, like Alex donation or the, the Willard Gay Heart donation, um, where people feel compelled to, if I'm not present, do this work for me on my behalf and give me, you know, what, what they, they feel like sharing. You, you never know what is going to come back when you um, ask the universe for things, which is why I have a disclaimer on the website. Um, when I work with older recordings from the 30s or 40s, I, I take some editorial judgment. I don't probably even have to tell you what word I'm thinking of, especially in some of the southern states. But when I record today and I sit down with someone and I say, what, what can you give me? you can't really control what comes out of someone's mouth. And so that word is, is in the collection. And I just don't feel like it's my editorial responsibility to take things out once they've been shared with me. Um, so statement of responsibility is important, but um, I haven't had any sensitivity around that. I think people understand that memories of an earlier era reflect the earlier era. So that's been okay. But yeah, I, I, like I said earlier in the talk, I think I'm getting more and more um, antsy when I meet someone that seems like they might know something. And, and then I'm just like, did your family ever sing? And we might be talking about the weather or something and it's just a non sequitur at this point because I just, you know, and, and you get treats that way. Um, when I was in England, uh, I, was, I was nearing the end of my stay. It was like a week or two left. And I, I was walking down the block to turn into the cul-de-sac that where I lived. And there was this gentleman like watching these people work on his roof. And he had like a, a patterned vest on and this like wild gray hair and, and these horn room glasses. And he was like a Harry Potter character. And I was like, he's gonna know something neat. And, but I kept walking. I mean, it was like, you know, it was, it was sort of awkward to just accost someone in the street and be like, what do you know about old music? Um, and, but I got to the end of my block and I was like, Derek, you're not here that much longer, just go ask him. And so I kind of shyly went up and I, I was like, you know, hi, I'm a folklorist and I'm really interested in some of the older traditions. And I don't know why, but I feel like you're going to know something like worth hearing. You know, what do you got? And his mother had gone with Edric Connor, 
who was one of the first uh, African-American actors. They went to the West Indies when this gentleman was like one years old. They brought the, her, their baby over to the West Indies and they were folk collecting. So he actually is the mother of, uh, the, the, his mother was a song catcher. He's the son of a song catcher. And she collected from this 90 year old man in the Indies, the Virgin Mary had a baby boy. I don't know if anyone knows this hymn, but he tapped out like six seconds of it. The recording on the website isn't even worth playing. It's like, the Virgin Mary had a baby boy. Da -da 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 -da. Yep, yep, that's how it goes. You know, it's, the, the recording is nothing, but the, the fact that that hymn got introduced to the Cambridge Hymnal in like 1961, and there's a, um, let's see if I can find it. Um, Zoom is sort of getting in the way. Um, I remember hearing that song because, uh, There's a camp song record that was recorded right here in the U.S. And um, it's called The Songs of Camp. Um, and it's on Smithsonian Folkways. So you can, it's pretty easy to find. But um, The Virgin Mary Had a Baby Boy is one of the ones that these children in, in America sang in camp. So it, the, the hymn, whether you've heard of it or not, actually did become quite widespread. So here I was, you know, by happenstance, I met the son of the woman that sort of bridged that hymn into broad accessibility. So that was really neat. And that was me just asking on, you know, on, on a total leap of like, I don't know this person and it's not preordained. So more and more, I'm getting a little more feral with my collecting and I'm asking people just, just winging it. Um, so I think that will speak to the legacy of the project because I'm just, the more I've found, the more emboldened I get. And the more I realize like, you know, time is passing. So I need to, you know, like trot, not gallop, you know, or gallop, not trot, whichever one it is. It's, or, or we could, I could do both, <laughs> mix it up a little bit. But yeah, I think that um, I'm, I'm taking more of a guerrilla approach now. So I'm getting this project into a lot of newspapers and magazines and, and you know, not so much, you know, for, for this beautiful mug to be in print, but um, at the end of the articles, I'm always leaving my contact info for people to write in and, and people have. So, you know, to just build a, a network slowly um, of, of uh, approachability. And I also made sure that the website was super approachable. Um, one of the things I sort of take qualms with, with academic collections is you'll click on a collection you want to hear and you'll get like a weird container and then you'll get like a drop down list and then you might get a link to a song if you're lucky, but the media isn't always there and it's, it can be a headache. So I wanted this to be like, you know, Play-Doh where you could just click the song and hear it. So um, I've tried to keep it pretty user-friendly, just to encourage people to come forward, you know, and not feel intimidated. The oldest song, I, I was in North Carolina uh, and I met a woman who ran a bakery and uh, she had a Blue Ridge Music Trail sign in her cafe. So I did obviously ask what her connection was and asked if her family sang. And she sang me this really short song she called The Chapels of France. Um, my French is terrible, but it was like, Notre Dame and Declare y Vendôme, Vendôme. And it's something that kids did sing in camp, I found out later, but her mother had learned it in Cincinnati from the sisters of, but um, you know, this, this order in Cincinnati had probably kept this song alive for centuries. And it dates to, I, I believe it dates to the 13th century. Um, there's also one people might know called Pragi When According. Uh, that's a song from 1542, I think was the earliest text people were able to find. So there are Pragi When According, sure. I've got a million versions of that. Um, let's see, I'll pick a good one. Uh, no, I wanna go by title. There's several here. Uh, a lot of them are fragments because it's so, it's, the song is so well known that people don't bother to sing the whole thing anymore because they assume uh, you know how it goes. Um, so there's not, there's not a good recording in the, uh, I'll, do, I'll do a few pieces of it for you. Uh, the, the way I learned it, which was an Arkansas version. Um, Froggy went to court and he sure did ride to my rock struck by Mr. Gamble, had a sword and a pistol buckled to his side, rock struck by Mr. Gamble, Kimo, Haimo, Kimo, Kaimo, Roddy, Roddy, Ray, Rob Strop, Penny Winkle, Flannel, Doodle, Yellow Bugger, Rob Strop, by Mr. Gamble. 
He rode right up to Miss Mousie's house. Rops dropped by Mr. Gamble, said, please can I marry you, Miss Mouse? Rops dropped by, by Mr. Gamble. Sir, I cannot tell you that. I'll have to ask my Uncle Rat. Rops dropped by Mr. Gamble. So um, Uncle Rat gave his consent. Rops dropped by Mr. Gamble. So the weasel wrote out the publishment. Rops dropped by Mr. Gamble. He mo ha mo ki mo ki mo roddy roddy ray. Rops drop penny winkle flannel doodle yellow bugger. Rops drop by Mr. Gamble. <laughs> well, with the demographic I work with now, the traditionalists, you largely get half memories of things because they weren't totally. The thing that happened with that generation is they sort of rebelled against what their parents were doing or their grandparents were doing. They were sort of embracing the industrial revolution. So a lot of the songs that I get now may have been sung at church, at camp, at school, in the home once or twice. Like um, the, the one of, that Alec recorded of his mom, that's the only song she remembers her dad singing. He didn't sing other folk songs. And then my friend in Indiana had a, a grand, great grandfather uh, who was born in 1905. The only song he ever sang was Jan Janssen, which is short. You know, my name is Jan Janssen. I come from Wisconsin. I work in a lumber mill there. When people say hi, they say, what's your name? My name is, you know, it goes on and on and on. There's not much to that song. So it's like a little bitty thing. And I think that um, at this point, the application or context was mostly like family memory, like one song people, you know, might've known. Outside of that, it's church, school, camp. Um, I think if I had started this, even 50 years earlier, I would get more memories of people that perhaps remembered their grandparents singing with greater breadth and variety. Like if their grand, like, so Sandra's grandpa was born in 1886. That's, he would have been a very old man had he lived, you know, so that's good. But I don't have a lot of people where the song originates from someone born in the 19th century. Most of my informants are like, yeah, my dad sang this. He was born in 1911 or something. Um, so the broad application of folk song as far as like working in lumber mills, threshing, gardening, harvesting, you know, working kind of falls out of favor. You know, I was in um, Britain at a pub and this guy was like, oh yeah, all the singers here have gone. There was even this one guy who would whistle. And then I found out that whistling in North England was like a tradition you'd do while you were like, you know, window cleaning or chimney sweeping. There were these really complex whistling songs. Um, I never found a single one, but you know, this is, uh, it goes to show how the context has changed in the 21st century. Um, and you're also inundated by like iPads and, you know, Zoom and, you know, you know, the modernity and, and, and you do kind of have to roll with it. But it also, because these things are coexisting, this oral tradition that is a pure expression of, of just, you know, knee to ear, as they call it, um, alongside, you know, like, so in like 200 years, you know, someone will be like, my great grandpa sang baby shark, you're gonna have to just kind of roll with it, you know, like that is gonna be the future of these traditional songs, but because they're coexisting right now, I can be selective about that, certainly. Mm -hmm. I would if it organically presented itself. Another question I get a lot is like, why haven't you um, recorded any uh, Native American songs? Because I haven't been on a Native American uh, reservation. You know, I also tried to go and see the gypsies which is a pejorative, but that's what they call them in England. It's the travelers of mostly Romani people in Britain. And I did try to um, go to a, a Romani village while I was in York and it just never, like the, they're, they're pretty um, fluid in their, in their community. So I would pin down an older informant to sing and then the next day he, he wouldn't be in the mood. Um, and they also always want money, which of course I'd be happy to give them because they're a marginalized community. Um, but I'm also not, trying to single out a demographic and, and kind of be like bug scout, bug on a boy scout, bug scout, bug scout, boy scout bug on a cotton swab kind of thing. I'm not like looking, you know, for, um, I think when things organically present themselves to me, that will be my, you know, um, yeah, like organic inroad to a conversation. Um, yes. Well, Oliver Sacks wrote Musicophilia, which I encourage you all to read. It's a wonderful book about patients with um, Alzheimer's and dementia, and they don't know their own last name, but you'll put on a song from their youth and they will recall it. Um, repeat visits help. Uh, I don't always have that luxury, but sometimes I'll go to see someone and they'll be like, I don't, nobody sang. Or for instance, I spent um, 
three hours with one of Lena's nieces, Judy Arrowood. And I, I stayed that long because I was leaving Appalachia like the next day. It was like my last day down in Elk Park. And Judy was someone who had a lot of family history. And she was like, I remember Lena, but I just don't remember her singing. Maybe she never sang around me. I don't know. And, and then as we talked for those three hours, she did finally remember um, her cousins coming over who were Lena's brother's kids. And they sang, um, don't sell daddy any more whiskey. They know, I know they will take him away. Mama is crying and the baby is hungry. Don't sell him no liquor today. You know, and like that was all she could remember. But it took like three hours to even get that fragment out from her. But but it does, it'll sneak up on on someone once they're they're really in flow with, you know, because it's like, I obviously adore these songs and perform a lot of them. But to be put on the spot and be like, name five songs you can sing. I'm always like, um, I don't know. You know, it's 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 hard to be put on the spot. So I find repeat visits help especially when people have memory problems, for sure. But, but generally, you know, I don't remember what I had for breakfast, probably because I didn't have any, but that's another story. <laughs> but yes, I, I, I try and have a, a rapport with my informants and I try and have a, an organic friendship if it's there. Some people obviously um, don't like me. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, but just, you don't always have the luxury of time to connect with someone, but uh, I, I try and really push for, for an organic kind of chemistry with, with the person. So I'll, I'll probably play this song so we get a kind of a, a grip on it um, and then we can give it a go in, in person. Um, so I recorded this song um, August 2nd, 2021, when I went to North Yorkshire. Uh, I actually met this gentleman, Will Noble, who has been to Danbury, if you can believe it or not. We were talking about the Danbury Fair Mall and it sort of blew my mind that he would even know what that was. Um, Will is a um, dry stone waller, so he builds um, very, very tight, very tidy dry stone Yorkshire walls. And I guess he's so good at it that they shipped him over to the U.S. to build some in New England. So he knew we were talking about Danbury Fair Mall, and I was like, um, and and um, he sang this song. And as we near Christmas, I felt like it might be a fun one to sing. Uh, it's also one of the few in the archive that has a chorus, so I figured that was, you know, if, if you don't do the verses, you can at least do the chorus, but we'll listen to Will sing it with his wife, and then we can try it as a group if you guys want to. Um, so this is, this is the way Will sang it to me. The mistletoe in the old castle hall, the holly branch shone on the old oak wall, and the baron's retainers were blithe and gay, a keeping their Christmas holiday. And the baron beheld with a father's pride his beautiful child, young Lovell's bride, whilst she with a bright eye seemed to be the star of the godly company. Oh, the mistletoe bough, oh, the mistletoe bough. I'm weary of dancing now, she cried. Here, tarry a moment, I'll hide, I'll hide. And love will be sure thou art the first to trace the clue to my secret hiding place. Away she ran and her friends began, each tower to search, each nook to scan. And lovely cried, where dost thou hide? I'm lonely without thee, my own dear bride. Oh, the mistletoe bough, oh, the mistletoe bough. They sought her that night, they sought her next day, they searched all around till a week went away. In the highest, the lowest, the lonesomest spot, young Lovell sought wildly but found her not. And as years went by, their grief at last was told as a sorrowful tale long past. And when Lovell appeared, all the children cried, See the old man weeps for his fairy bride. Oh, the mistletoe bough, oh, the mistletoe bough. At length an old chest that had long lain hid was found in the 
castle, they raised the lid. A skeleton form lay mouldering there in the bridal wreath of a lady so fair. Oh, sad was her fate in sportive jest. She hid from her lord in an old oak chest. It closed with a spring on the bridal bloom. Lay withering there in a living tomb. Oh, the mistletoe bough. Oh, the mistletoe Uh, I have collected that. I, I had a real character called Fran Hendrickson play that for me on accordion a couple weeks ago. Um, I That was a minstrel song um, and uh, gained a lot of favor. Um, I, well, I think it was, I'm trying to remember now. I, I did research on that song because I have a, um, I don't sing it yet, but I have like a compiled version of it because there's like a million verses. Um, I first heard the Desiric sisters sing it um, and they yodel. It was like a, a, a pair of twin sisters that yodeled and did like a, an early country act. Um, yeah, I, I believe either that song was, was an African-American written song that turned into minstrelsy or it was the other way around. It was a minstrel song that got adopted by black singers. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it is a favorite. Like, like when I ask people if they know the old songs, it is one I ask for. And, and she was, Fran was the only person to know it. She's like, played it on accordion it was pretty neat now uh, what made you ask about that song did you what was the what was the verse you sang old dan tucker was a mighty man washed his face in a frying pan died, um combed his hair with a wagon wheel and died of a toothache in his heel get out the way old dan tucker get out the way old dan tucker get out the way old dan tucker you're too late to get your supper oh i don't know that verse see there's a million verses to it yeah well how does that go it's kind of like Cindy. Does anyone know the song Cindy? Um, there's a million verses to that too. Um, get along home, Cindy, Cindy. Get along home, Cindy, Cindy. Get along home, Cindy, Cindy. I'm going to leave you now. Um, and now I can't remember. The, see, this is what I mean about having time with your informants. Like when, you're, when you're put on the spot, you don't remember anything. <laughs> not like, again, not like it's organic, but I, I'm, when, I, when I get the songs, I try and find out where they came from and certainly how old they are. Um, I think the most contemporary song is The Blackboard of My Heart, which was like an early country hit. I think that was written in the 50s. Um, and then obviously the oldest songs are from the 14th century or, or 15th century. Um, but I, um, I haven't like gone out of my way to go just towards one ethnic minority. Um, although that's reminding me I was gonna play this one Polish song that, that I really enjoy. Um, but uh, we're running out of time. So you might have to just go look on the archive um, for Sister Frances, who I've known uh, since I was very small, and I went to her retirement community, and she uh, sang a couple of short Polish hymns for me uh, because I had struck out that day, like none of the residents I, I was working with. Well, there was one woman who knew Frankie and Johnny and wouldn't sing it for me. What are we going to do about that? I think I need to, that, there's a repeat visit target right there, but um, she was kind of consoling me by singing me Dzisiaj um, Bethlehem and uh mi Shifti Dostoevsky, which are two Polish Christmas carols. Um, and uh, I bring her up because she was, she had sort of an ethnic minority experience. Uh, she grew up in Jamaica, New York, and went to St. Joseph's School, which uh, had opened its doors to a lot of Polish immigrants at that time. Um, so, uh, but no, I haven't like, I haven't gone out of my way for, for just a, a particular minority. Again, I feel like that's sort of like the Boy Scout bug cotton batting. Yeah, I would love to, you know, like, and, and that's the other thing is I haven't really worked with younger informants. Um, I was going to maybe go to the Waldorf school uh, and, and, and interview um, and, and watch them because that's a big part of their practice. But um, uh, clapping songs and, and, and um, uh, dance calls and, and things like that. Um, haven't done that yet. Um, I think there's just more red tape when it's younger people. Um, there's, there's plenty of red tape at nursing homes. Uh, I bring a release form. You know, there's media release forms that they have on their end. I have a media release form. Um, I would like to um, record uh, children uh, in, for the archive. Most of my rec 
informants are very old. Um, you know, my friend Kenny is the only person in the archive in his 20s. Everyone is like 30s and over. Um, the, the, the vast majority being in their 70s and over, I would say. Yeah, well, not as much. And then my friend Bob, who's a dance caller, I'll, I'm going to go to a thing at the um, Sharon Grange this weekend. He's going to do like a square dance thing. Um, and he sang um, My Country Tis of Thee, and I took it because everyone knows that song. But Bob is so old that they sang it pre-World War II, and so they sang it like this. My country. So I was like, wow, you know, that's that's old school, like very literally old school. So, um, yeah, so, that, you know, they're, they're definitely customs change all the time. I, I'd be surprised if kids even sing that song in school anymore. I don't think people sing my country to the Z. Um, I think it just smacks as too fascistic or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, I, you know, this is all going away and changing every day so quickly. Um, yeah, I, I got a, a, an entire room of um, at Putnam Ridge, the residents all saying this land is your land with me. Another sort of, that's contemporary. It's like from the forties, but you know, this land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands, from the Gulf Stream forest to the Gulf Stream water. This land was made for you and me. And that's the wonderful thing about talking about these kinds of songs is, is everyone knows at least one or two and it's such a great connector. It really is.